Hello. What is our defence budget for? It's about 2% of our national income, going up to about £40 billion a year by the end of the decade. Unfortunately, £40 billion doesn't buy as much as it used to. And the head of the Army, General Sinek Carter, set out the arguments for spending more today, mostly by reference to the threat of a stronger Russia. But you can't decide what the right level of spending is until you know what it's for. You have to give the military a big budget or narrow priorities. You can't expect them to do everything with nothing. So is fighting Russia what we think British defence is about these days, or any country? Britain is set to have a major review of priorities this year, which actually explained why Sir Nick Carter made his pitch today. So we'll be looking at some of the central questions. First, though, here's our defence editor, Mark Urban. So the defence review that dare not speak its name is dead. Long live the Strategic Defence and Security Review. It's not a pretty story from the government's point of view. Faced with higher costs for buying equipment from abroad and an overset programme, the Cabinet Office started looking for cuts late last summer. People in Whitehall told me it couldn't be called a review because the then Defence Secretary Michael Fallon had conducted one of those in 2015 and didn't like the optics of having to do one again so soon. But it went deeper than that as the Cabinet Office conducted its capability refresh, as some people called it, it started to look at possible deep cuts to Britain's armed forces. Details then leaked and MPs became outraged. Newsnights learned that the Royal Navy would lose its ability to assault enemy-held beaches. Critically, when Newsnight broke the news that there were plans to get rid of the amphibious landing fleet, it touched off angry scenes in Parliament. Why should thousands of soldiers, sailors and airmen be lost, elite units be merged, or aircraft, frigates and vital amphibious vessels be scrapped long before their out-of-service dates? When Michael Fallon resigned in November, his successor, Gavin Williamson, got the Prime Minister's backing to stop the original cost-cutting exercise. Now we can expect a full strategic defence and security review in the spring and summer. And today, the army chief set the stage, warning that Britain must do more to counter Russia's enhanced military capabilities and willingness to use them. I believe our ability to preempt or respond to these threats will be eroded if we don't match up to them now. They represent a clear and present danger. Critical to the exercise now is not just an attempt to balance the books, but to define the purpose of the British Armed Forces post-Brexit. What hard power role does global Britain expect to play and how much will that cost? If Britain keeps on cutting, an army of 60,000 was mooted in the last exercise, what role can it really play in helping its friends or making any realistic preparations for war against another state. Mark Urban, and Mark is with me now. Um, you referred the, you used the word cutting there, Mark. I mean, on existing policy, is spending going up? Well, cutting of uh, capability was, was envisaged in this exercise over the last few months. Yeah, the government says, look, we are spending more and more. And yes, you look 37, 38.1 or whatever, you look at the spending plans and it is more each year. A guarantee to spend more after inflation on equipment. It's not enough, though. Critically, uh, the depreciation of sterling on big programmes like the F-35 fighter, Trident replacement has bitten in uh, far more deeply than those rises can cope with. And the forces have done what they've been doing constantly since the war. They've overset the programme. They've put in too many things. They cannot afford all of their ambitions. Right. OK, now, we're going to have this review, strategic defence review this year. Let's suppose we're going to do one now with our guests in 10, min in 10 minutes on what the priorities are. What is the question and why? Well, I think the most critical question is uh, the average member of the public thinks the armed forces are here to fight other countries if that really has to happen in extremists. But the truth is that since the end of the Cold War, Britain simply doesn't have that ability anymore. Uh, and you can park Russia and China, I mean, they're really mega ones for a bit. Any country or non-state actor, and there are some, that can attack warships with 
fast uh, supersonic anti-shipping missiles, people with submarines, that could be Iran, North Korea, uh, people with uh, sophisticated air defence uh, networks. All of these countries have capabilities that the UK cannot really either uh, f f uh, overmatch, resist or take on. Even the air defences of a country like Syria were causing consternation in MOD when they were asked seriously to look in 2013 at whether or not uh, the UK could do airstrikes. So it's really about any other country with sophisticated weapon like fast weapons, fast jets, missiles, submarines, and critically, once it starts, the stocks of things like torpedoes, anti-aircraft missiles, artillery shells are so low that Britain couldn't fight literally for more than a day or two. Well, Mark, that's a, that's a good question. Thank you very much. Well, let's raise that then. Joining me now is the Conservative MP and former British Army Captain Johnny Mercer. I'm also joined by military historian and commentator Max Hastings and Kishwa Faulkner, who's a Liberal Democrat peer and former National Security uh, Strategy Committee member for the Liberal Democrats. And former Assistant US Secretary of Defence Graham Allison joins us uh, from the US. He's now Douglas Dillon Professor at the Government School at Harvard Kennedy School. And I'll start with you, if I may, uh, Graham Allison. Thank you very much for joining us. Because I want an American perspective on a medium power, medium sized power, just off Europe, across the Atlantic. What should we be spending on defence and what should we think of our role as being? Well, it's a very tough, tough set of questions, and I don't envy the people that will struggle with it. But I think Britain historically has played a crucial role of leadership in Europe. Britain will not be able to defend itself against Russia, but Britain, as part of an alliance, can hope to create a stable Europe, which, in fact, we've actually done and seen in the period since World War II, including after the Cold War. So Britain's military forces are most of all about getting it a seat at the table and a voice in trying to shape sensible policy in Europe and indeed in the relationship with the US. OK, so that's a really clear answer. Now here, let me put this to you. OK, I think we get a seat at the table if we spend 2% of our national income on defence because that's the NATO target. Most other NATO countries aren't even spending that. Is that. Should that be our aspiration or do you think we need to go further to maintain that kind of medium power role for ourselves? Well, I believe the 2% is important uh, symbolically because persuading Americans that we should spend more of our taxpayers' money t to defend Europe than Europeans do is not a long-term winning proposition. When Trump expresses that skepticism, that actually reflects a widespread view in the U.S. Now, I, I don't agree with it, but certainly the majority would do so. So I think that, that, having, that, that keeping the U.S. significantly in the game and having Europeans play their part is very important. But secondly, more important than how much money is spent, I think it's a crucial to meet the 2% criteria, but more important is what to buy. And I think, unfortunately, both in the American uh, defense budget and the British defense budget. We are way too far into legacy systems that are hugely expensive and too short on new technologies that could make a more significant difference. So that's the place where I would drill down if I were part of the British Strategic Review. Professor Graham Allison, thank you so much. That's a really clear start uh, to this discussion. Well, let me turn to my other guests. And Max Hastings, I'm going to start with you because I want you to paint for me a scenario that we couldn't deal with now, but you think we should be able to deal with, because I know you believe we should be spending more. Well, the most obvious point is the Russians are all the time trying to push the frontiers, especially in the Baltic states. There's a small British contingent up in the Baltic states at the moment. But what Nick Carter, I think, was trying to say today, this was intended as a wake-up call, that in recent years we've been looking overwhelmingly at a terrorist threat to Britain, um, or we, we'd be worrying most about what terrorists can do on the streets. Nick Carter is saying we're living in a new world in which there are two things. It's an old world, isn't it? <laughs> it's back, to, are, back to the past, are, isn't it? There are, well, not quite, because the old idea that you have a state of peace and a state of war is, is off the agenda. The what Graham Allison, among other people, have written um, a very vivid accounts of in the last year or two is that we've moved into a new world in which we're never again going to have hopefully, we may not have a big war, but we're very unlikely to have absolute peace. And we're going to be having to cope with all sorts of threats at different levels, electronic threats, cyber threats, right. um, 
and also uh, perhaps low-level military threats in places like the Baltic states. Nick Carter said today, he said, one platoon of boots on the ground is worth more than a squadron of aircraft. We are at the moment, last summer, an American general said to me, very frankly and bluntly, um, he said, the British armed forces have now become so small that they're not taken seriously by either your friends or your enemies. And I said, well, I hope the next time that you see our prime minister, you say that to her, because Americans are often too polite to us. Right. They okay. don't tell us what they really think. Right. So the that's Royal the Air scenario. Force but that's the scenario. The Marine Air Wing. That's the scenario. It's say a Russian incursion into Estonia or something yeah, like that, absolutely. where we want to be players. Can I ask the other two of you? Do you agree we should be able to make a real contribution on an occasion like that? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. we're committed to through NATO membership, apart from anything else. Uh, but but it also comes back to a situation where we can't. The public have got too used to wars of choice. Yeah. Wars in faraway places where we have a long debate, we have debates in Parliament, and then we decide whether we want to intervene or not. Wrongly, in my opinion, in 2013 on yeah. Syria, where we should have intervened. But I don't think the public understands that there is such a thing as a potential European theatre, and there is such a thing as state-to-state -state warfare in a way that they haven't seen in, in new right. generations. OK, and just quickly, Johnny Mercer, do you agree that we need to be able to deal with that kind of situation? I just want to see whether you all agree that well, this is... Well, of course, is, the, the only thing that should define the size and strength of the armed forces is the adversaries we're up against. I mean, that is, you know, you can talk about 2%, you can talk about well, you more you could than say, that. look, Estonia is Estonia, we don't have to care about it. Well, and, absolutely and, and, not, and, because, and, you're, you know, the, yes, that is a, a line on the ground, but it's the whole uh, process of, uh, of, uh, of Russia aggression and what they've done in the Ukraine and how that's manifested right. itself in these different types of so what I now want to get is how much extra we have to spend in order to deliver that. Johnny Mercer, what extra would it take? I mean, we're at 2% of GDP, 2.5%, 3%. What is it we need? In, in my view, Evan, that, that, you know, um, the chat from America had it absolutely spot on. That is a symbol. That is a, a signal of intent. The real question is, what is the future of the British Armed Forces? What do we look for them to do? What do we want from them? What is the threat we're up okay, against? We want them to go and into Nick Estonia Carter, and make a contribution. Nick Carter to the has laid there. that out today, and it should be welcome that he's he's come forward. You know, he's he's had this enlightened point of view that the character of conflict is changing, and we now need to have a national discussion because ultimately these taxpayers pay for it, right? Right. Well, I'm so going to come back to you at the end on that. that what, what do you each think we need extra to spend, Max? Very briefly. You can't put exact. Now, the the right way around to look at this is not to say should it be one percent. 2% is to say, what should we be trying to do in the new world? Now, one thing we've never done realistically is we have defence review after defence review. They're always a joke because there are so many ring-fenced areas. I mean, I'm, for example, a um, heretic about I believe that the Trident nuclear deterrent is no longer relevant to the particular situation we are, and I think it's ridiculously expensive. Be that as it may, the Trident nuclear deterrent, no British political party is willing to talk about that. Nobody's willing to talk about scrapping the Gurkhas because the British public loves them. Right. No one's willing to talk about doing anything about the Scottish regiments, which are wildly under-recruited. Until we have a realistic defence review in which we look realistically at the threats out there and what we want to achieve, until we stop right. playing political games, we are not going to have credible armed forces. Kishu, I want, do you have an idea? Because I, I, I buy everything you're saying. You need to work out what you need to do and then ask how much it's going to cost. I'm the Chancellor, you're the Defence Secretary, we've all agreed on the objective. How much extra do you need? What are we talking about? Two billion, twenty billion? You, do, you, you need, I think, a fairly significant chunk extra. Uh, it's impossible to put the figure, but there, is, there are a couple of things that you could do. You could disaggregate cyber from the budget and use, you know, have a corporate levy or something like that, because cyber is used, our cyber defense capabilities, our offensive capabilities are used across the board by public institutions, commerce and stuff like that. You could look at the defense review to see, as Max and, and Johnny have said, the capabilities that you need, and then very carefully see where you can get the maximum value added. I mean, we've got two aircraft carriers. We know that we will never be able to have task force groups of both of them. We know that. So we need to think how we ended up having to. They were a to, catastrophe. Uh, a catastrophe. Right, okay. catastrophe. So we've, 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 overdone we've done the overdone Evan, the Evan I think the most very important briefly. point in this whole debate is this is an attempt by, I think a rather brave attempt by the Chief of General Staff, yeah backed to by the Defence Secretary to better. try and get the British public to look at what is going right. on out there in the world. He's the elected MP. He's actually got voters to deal with. Yeah. Extra money for the NHS or Defence? 
Look, these are uh, NHS in some ways is similar because the demand and the the challenge right. around the NHS is changing all the time, living longer and all you that. Want stuff. With defence, no, wait. With defence, it's the same. The threat is changing, and as politicians, we have to meet that. Right. There is so no use having your ideological position. We have to have higher without taxes. meeting you want uh, more the challenge money. that we're expected. You, you to want more money by on people who vote for us. You want more money on defence. You want more money on the NHS. You're not going to have extra borrowing. You need taxes to go up to pay for all this, don't you? Well, that's not. It's not a grown-up question to say. <laughs> Um, it's got to be the NHS or defence. Yeah. No, in no, the grown-up world, it's, it's, we have to be look at the whole range yeah. of issues facing government. Yeah. And it's, it's what's happening at the moment is that government is become, has to become so fixated with the NHS and social spending that we are not thinking nearly hard enough about security. But if taxes you, have we need to, to go up, there. they have to go up. We need to leave it there. Thanks all very much indeed. That was a really, really good discussion.